In the 1990s, North Korea suffered one of the worst famines of the 20th century, which was a traumatic event that continues to reverberate through North Korean society, and which I will go through in certain, a certain amount of detail. That event uh, ultimately uh, resulted in an international engagement effort, which is the longest running uh, engagement between North Korea and the, the broader global community. And so what I would like to do in the course of this, uh, uh, these remarks is basically go through an analysis of the famine itself, which I, which I personally think is of great interest, and I hope I can convince you to, uh, to uh, share that view. Uh, an analysis of the international response to that event and, and the interactions between the international community and the government of North Korea. And then finally, come back to the issue uh, of what relevance this might have for our own, our ongoing efforts, not only in the humanitarian aid sphere, but in the issue of denuclearization. What we observe, we observe in market economies is that these things occur when parts of the population suffer severe losses in real income and cannot purchase food. What we observe in socialist economies is that rather than being de determined by the ability to command resources in the marketplace, access to food is typically politically determined. And so it's politically disfavored groups that um, uh, do not, are unable to access food. Is that the North Korean famine of the 1990s started out as a classic socialist famine in which access to food was politically determined, but as a result of a grassroots bottom-up marketization of the economy that the famine started or accelerated, it morphed into something that is much more similar to what we would observe in a market economy or a transitional economy. And it morphed into what is essentially a chronic food emergency in which parts of the population uh, have uh, tenuous access to food based on their inability to purchase it in the market. Second part of the statement is people starve uh, when there are famines, they, they die of starvation. Uh, typically, that's not the case. Typically, people die of other things in their weakened states uh, uh, rather than starving per se. In the case of North Korea, uh, a lot of the deaths were t due to tuberculosis, for example. We estimate that the famine killed 600,000 to a million people in North Korea in the 1990s, which would be about 3 to 5 percent of the pre-crisis pre population. And that would be equivalent to about 15 million people dying uh, if such an event were to occur here in the United States. First of all, there are certain famine-specific lessons uh, having to do with the nature of the regime um, that has basically allowed this to happen. But from the standpoint of the nuclear issue, I think what you can say is that the North Korean government is absolutely ruthless in its pursuit of its core political goals narrowly defined. And if one goes through the sorts of obstacles that they put into uh, the paths of the official and private sector uh, humanitarian relief groups over a period of a, more than a decade now, since 1995, uh, one shudders to think uh, how resistant the North Koreans will be when it comes time for arms inspectors to actually go in and do inspection and verification of the nuclear agreement. I mean, if this is, I mean, the lesson, the basic lesson I take away from this is that if this is how the North Koreans treat 50 do-gooders going around handing out free food, uh, I, I can't imagine how they will respond uh, to the desire by foreigners to do challenge inspections of uh, military facilities. So in that sense, it is a negative and pessimistic conclusion about the state of cooperation, at least, uh, between North Korea and the rest of the world. The third lesson is that the North Koreans are very effective at exploiting divergences of interests uh, among uh, uh, different uh, countries. When you actually aggregate the total amount of aid going into North Korea, although the individual components vary a lot, the total is actually fairly steady. Um, and we see that, uh, I, I think, in, in the current situation in which North Korea uh, can try to exploit uh, differences among uh, its counterpart, its diplomatic counterparts. The bottom line is, ultimately, I, I don't think we have any uh, real ethical choice or any practical political choice other to engage either on the humanitarian issues or on the, on the uh, military issues. But I think we need to be very clear-eyed about the terms of, those of, of that engagement. And 
when structuring those engagements, whether it be in the humanitarian relief uh, sphere or in the diplomatic sphere, we should try to structure those, um, those relations in a way that actually uh, promote um, the values that as an international community that we would like to see uh, upheld.